Hey everybody, I'm just recording this real quick. This is going to go right at the beginning. Uh, Taya has taken over my podcast for one episode, and I am just so happens that the guest is, uh, well, I'll let you guys uh, hear the guest from her. But I just wanted to say real quick that prior to the podcast, her Kickstarter for like Miss Over Eyes was not funded, but as of now, it is, and it will be available at the Edmonton Expo. And I just wanted to say this really quick to Taya. I'm proud of you. Congratulations, and I can't wait to see it when I get there. All right, on to the show. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Just Joshing. I am not Josh, as was probably very obvious. Um, my name is Taya Van Diepen, I am a friend of Josh's. You've probably heard me being interviewed by him before. And since today is Topsy Turvy Day, I am going to be the one interviewing Josh. He gets to get asked the questions this time. <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit about me. I am also an author. I write stories on the edge of familiarity, and I have four books out by now, and if my Kickstarter was successful last month, as in, I don't know because I am recording this in the past and speaking to you the f to in the future because apparently, you know, time travel on the internet is a common phenomenon. If that Kickstarter did in fact go well, then my fifth book will be coming out later this month. It's called Like Mist Over the Eyes, and it is the second book in the White Changeling series. The first book was Hidden in Sealskin. Fun fact, you can actually read the second book without having read the first book, but why would you do that when there is a first book out there and you know now that it exists? So here's the story of Like Mist Over the Eyes in one sentence. <laughs> An outlaw battling unwelcome dreams must hold herself together amid an ancient feud between fairies and humans, or else lose all hope of finding a cure for her insane unicorn. I've also described it as a fast-paced fantasy novel about fairies, uneasy trust, and a whole lot of magic. Because magic is cool! And one of my beta readers described it as dark, but with surprising moments of sweetness and humor. The first book Hidden in Sealskin is currently available on Amazon in both ebook and paperback. And like I said, if all goes well, fingers crossed, then Like Mist of the Eyes will be available on September 19th. Again, in both paperback and ebook. So now here's the part where Josh said, Taya, you can talk for five whole minutes. And Josh, Josh, I don't know if you realize, but five whole minutes is a lot of minutes. And I'll tell you how I know this. I was once almost on the basketball team in high school, and I don't know exactly how close I got to being on that basketball team, but it was probably pretty close because the coach asked me to basically be the manager or something of the team. So I had some non basketball playing responsibilities to do. So I got to be there during all the practices and help write out plays so that everybody could look at it and see, okay, oh yeah, this is their strategy and all that. Get water for the players, things like that. Got to go to all the games too. That was fun. And at one point in one of the practices, the coach said, okay, you can hold the ball for five seconds max because, you know, the rule of basketball. That's why players keep passing the ball back and forth to everybody's because they can only hold it for five seconds. But then she said, okay, so think about it. Five seconds. That sounds really short, right? But, and then she counted out five seconds and showed us exactly how much you could do in five seconds. And not only that, then said a whole bunch of stuff and said it in five seconds. So really, if we're talking five seconds, or if you can say so much in five seconds, and now, Josh, you're asking me to talk for five 
whole minutes. That's like 60 seconds per minute. That's 60 times 5 is uh, 300. 60 times 5 is 300. Yeah, 300. 300. And that's um, 300 whole seconds. How many instances of 5 seconds are in there? That's, that's 60 instances of 5 seconds. You could have had the ball passed from one player to another 59 times in this whole time. Not 60, because we're starting with the first 5 seconds of the person. And basically, yes, this entire story is me just showing off the fact that I can do math in my head as I'm talking and making stuff up so that I can be talking for 5 minutes. This has absolutely nothing to do with any of my books. I just am good at math and apparently was almost in the basketball team in high school. So that you just heard that on this podcast. Like I said, I have a book coming out. Oh, other books that I have, which would be, you know, on topic for me to talk about at this moment. I have, uh, so like I said, I have four other books. I talked about Hidden in Sealskin. I have not yet talked about, uh, my first book was uh, Dreaming of Her and Other Stories. It's an anthology of short stories and poetry, and it ranges in from across a variety of different genres. There's fantasy, there's science fiction, magical realism, there's allegory, there's a literal nightmare. That was fun to write. And then my, the book that I published after that is called The Illuminated Heart. It's a retelling of the fairy tale like, well, just about said like Mist of the Eyes. Apparently this book is stuck in my brain. So The Illuminated Heart is a retelling of the fairy tale, east of the sun, west of the moon, except with zombies. Because, you know, hey, why not? And it's it takes place in Iceland instead of Norway, like the original story, which means I got to play with some Icelandic zombies, which are pretty different than, than your regular zombies in the sense that they are in fact intelligent and uh, can talk and predict the future and do magic and make your animals go insane and die. So that's always fun. And then the other book that I have out is a novelette. It's just, it's just slightly too long to be an actual short story. And it is called The Tree Remembers, and I don't have a sentence in front of me right now because I wasn't actually planning on talking about this, but I could sum it up in, in a sentence for you if I wanted to, or just my brain is not working right now, but it, it's, a, it's a good book. I, I, I like it. I, I wrote it. It's great. Um, just, just go look up this book. <laughs> Oh, and one more thing that I should mention, because Josh is probably going to be very sad if I don't mention this. I do have a webcomic called Care of the Brave. The whole first arc is done. The second arc is going up when I am able to get it up. And you can find it on the subdomain of my website. If you go to boardkidcomics.expectedaberrations.com, you will find it. And that's, uh, Aberrations has one B and two R's. If you Google it, you should be able to find it, theoretically. I haven't actually tried Googling it. Probably should have tested that first. But it's called Care of the Brave. You'll find it. I have faith in you. Oh, goodness, and look at this. I'm over five minutes. Okay, Josh, I, I, I take back my prior complaints. I'm, instead of complaining, I'm just going to keep talking about Kara the Brave. Kara the Brave is about a 10-year-old girl who is totally sure that she could be a hero. And then she gets in a situation where it's time to be a hero and finds out how well she really does. Alright, I think I have had enough for my intro. You guys all know Josh. He's, he's on every single episode of this of this show, so I am just going to turn it over to our interview. What's up? Hello. That goes. Good, how about you? Tired. Mm. <laughs> I worked all night, went uh, Thursday night, Friday morning. I ended up uh, doing a lot of work yesterday in terms of books and stuff like that with um, uh, 
some publicity stuff with Craig. I met with my artist for book three. I did some more work. I came back, and then I played Hearthstone way, way too long. So <laughs> <laughs> I just decided to get all the cards that, that I didn't have in the in the one expansion. I get the I buy the expansions in Hearthstone, and uh, mm. we got recording by the way. I'm just letting you know this right now. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's uh, yeah, it, it, this is where we're starting. I don't, I like, we'll, we'll go with it. You, by the way, you are the interviewer, and I'm the interviewee, so you can direct me however you want. This is your show. <laughs> this is not my show. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just the guest, happy to be interviewed. But I'll just finish. I get the expansions in Hearthstone. Hearthstone to me is like magic light. I, it's like playing a game I don't have to think okay. so hard with. Magic <laughs> has a lot more. Because magic has a lot more interactions that happen during each phase of the game, whereas Hearthstone's a little bit more straightforward, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot less micro plays in Hearthstone, so it's it's a little bit more straight to the face, which it has it has its good and bad. But you know when you when you uh, so I decided to unlock all the cards from this expansion, and lo and behold, it was six o'clock in the morning. Like, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> oh man. Okay, so I've never actually played magic. So what? How, what's the point of playing a game of Hearthstone? Like, what are you trying to do? Essentially, think of it like, like you're trying to kill the other guys by playing chess, right? But you're using cards, as, you're, using, you're using a random number generating system to okay. damage. Everybody's got a set life points. In Hearthstone, you have 30, I have 30. We each get five cards. Someone, the, the, it's randomly selected who goes first, and the other person has a coin. So they can get, they can keep, so they have one extra mana for, the sec, for their first turn. So they can keep up with the tempo on the on the guy's first turn. So in Hearthstone, the mana builds up each turn. You start with one mana, so you can play anything that costs one or less, right? Okay. Right. And uh, and then with turn two, you have two mana, and all the way till turn ten, when you get to ten mana, and that's where you stay at, right? Oh, okay. So there's like a cap for that. There's, okay. a, there's a cap for how much you can actually spend, which is a little different than Magic. Whereas Magic, there are ways to get infinite mana. That's something <laughs> that doesn't get. Oh yeah, I know. I, I once upon a time when I played Magic, there's this card called Polarian Academy. It was the mm. thing I'd ever seen. So land, land and Magic is you tap it right to produce land. Basically, you you exhaust the resource. But if you can mm. untap the land, you can use it again for mana. So if you can figure out a way, and and this particular land in particular, it was not impossible to generate something like ten land a shot with this one land, ten okay. mana. So if I could just untap it. As many times as I want, I have infinite mana, and that's <laughs> that's that's pretty much how magic. No, I mean some of the most some of the most um, some of the most ridiculous games I've ever played in Magic involves me or my opponent having infinite mana, because at that point it's just solitaire. I can do anything I want. Good game. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Good game. Draw a billion cards. That's usually that's usually how you finish it off. <laughs> Make the opponent draw his whole deck. That's so. That's one way of losing. In Hearthstone, you eventually lose that way. But in Magic, the moment you can't draw, it's over. So, um, so you make oh, them draw right. a billion cards, and it it it's over. Mm. Yeah, right. So <laughs> it's like this happened, and you and I'm not I'm not going to risk doing damage to you because you might reflect that back at me, and that will be right. bad. Back yes, that would. Yes. So that's that's. So yeah. So magic, magic is basically it, it's it's a strategy game. The only thing about magic is magic is this never ending sinkhole of, of putting money into because yeah, I kind of was. It seemed like they they always have new cards out. Well, it, it, new cards. The new cards isn't the issue. The idea of, of of keeping the game fresh that way is not a bad idea. But let's say there's this really powerful card that everybody wants to use. That mm -hmm. card individually goes for fifty bucks. Or, oh my goodness. Or more. There are cards. There, are, there are literally cards in the game that could pay for it. There, I had a buddy. No, no, no joke. Um, mm -hmm. He had the rarest cards in the game, and all that together equals about two years of your tuition of university. Oh my goodness. Yeah, about two years. Wow. Yeah. No, the game's been around a long. You gotta understand too. There's, there's a, there's a collectible feature to this as well, right? So. Well, yeah. So it, this game has been around now almost twenty five years. So when you have 25 yeah. years worth of cards, right? Especially in the beginning when they did not understand why certain things there was there were balances to the game, and when you tamper with said balances, mm -hmm. bad things happen, like mm -hmm. solitaire, right? And some of those old cards, I mean, are just horrible that way. So. Oh dear. <laughs> 
I, there, there are cards that I played from that those that that time where I have never lost playing those cards. It's just that they're that powerful. It's like, oh my goodness. There's one that turns your whole graveyard into your hand, which doesn't seem like power until you realize there's lots of cards that just dump things into your graveyard. And if you have and if the opponent choose which goes to your hand, it doesn't matter anymore because you can play both. Like there's some insane things in that game. It's it's it's. It's, it's it's a very complicated math game, is what it actually is. Where all the pretty Except, yeah. yeah, it's a math game. I am trying to get you from in Magic's case, I'm trying to get you from twenty to zero, right? Or I'm trying to draw, draw your land, I, I draw your deck. I'm trying, to, <laughs> which is an average of sixty cards, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, which is an average of sixty cards. So that those are the numbers you're playing with, right? You have seven cards in hand, right? And then there's and then there's percentages like well, like if you have a deck built with say twenty land that means one in three cards is land which is like essentially the money you spend right so or most people like I got to the point where I was doing twenty four land in my deck so I could keep consistency and tempo with my deck with that yeah. it, again it, it, it it's a math game it's 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 a really really sophisticated math game and mm -hmm. uh, lots of cool micro interactions it's a fun game. Um, but it, yeah, it's, it's expensive. Like, that's why I got rid of all my cards not too long ago, just for that reason. They were ridiculous. It's ridiculous to keep up. So, um, yeah, it sounds like it. I, there's somebody I follow on Twitter who every once in a while we speak, talk about magic stuff, but I'm like, I never understood what he was talking about. I just knew it was like a card game and you played it against people and the art looks interesting. That's, that's as far as my brain went with that. So it's like every time you tweet about it, I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. But now I think I'll know a bit more. <laughs> it's no, it, like, like, like it, again, it just, it, just think, just think of it in terms mm. of a math game, and it actually makes a lot more sense. Certain colors do certain things better, right? If like, 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 um, my favorite thing, my favorite colors in the game were red and blue, because red and blue are the trickier colors. Red's a little bit more straightforward. It goes straight for, yeah, I, I call red, um, straight for the king. Because in chess, the best one of the best ways to put pressure on your opponent is to put mm -hmm. is to attack the king at all times. Mm -hmm. They have mm -hmm. to move the king. They have to protect the king. It's one of the things about the yeah. game. So if you put the if you make them choose between protecting the king and say sacrificing their queen, which is a beautiful beautiful play, right? Mm -hmm. um, right. You've suddenly taken a key piece away from them. And we're doing mm -hmm. red decks do that all the time. And like, I'm going straight for your face. And if you don't stop me, I'm going to beat you down. And that's red. Right, right. Blue's a little bit more like I got counter spells. You know, like you know in Pokemon mm -hmm. Go, you like the more mystical, like the scientific thing. Blue is <laughs> blue is that color. It's the sign. It's it's the color of, and I play yes. and I like playing both together because I'm 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 a little impulsive, just just a little, and 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 I'm also, but I'm also very clever and tricksy. And when you put those two colors together in particular, it's it's. Mm. Couldn't you say that like almost any card or board game is a math game? Almost all of them are. I would, I would, I would, I would dispute. I would dispute a couple of them. Um, like, um, for example, I um, Monopoly doesn't really feel like a math game. It feels more. It, no, it really doesn't. You know, it deals with money. Okay. It doesn't actually feel like a math game. It's 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 more it's it's more about. It, it, it's more about exploiting other people. I'm not sure there's really. <laughs> I'm not sure. The, I, I think the math is actually kind of secondary there. It's just that it, it just it, right. Um, but here, you you can't really properly exploit other people in Monopoly unless you have a good handle on the math involved. Well, I'm saying I'm not saying that, but I I, I think I think it's just one of those things. I just look at well, I'm just like that's more a people skill game. I mean, that's where that comes in. Um, True, making bargains and stuff. Whenever I play with my younger siblings. My brother would always like constantly be trying to offer me a deal because he would get the most expensive properties, and then anytime like and then he'd like develop them like crazy, and then anytime like any of us landed on him, he'd be he would like oh okay so, like, you could pay all of this or we, I could offer you a deal. And the thing was is that the deal was always good in the short term for me, but good in the long term for him. Uh, that's just that, that's that's just. Mark. So at that point, I'm like, the only time I would ever actually like, because then I'd have to bargain with him to get something that was good for me. And the only time I'd actually bargain is if I could come up with something that I knew was good in the long term for me, because I knew he was playing it so that he had he had an advantage. Most of the time, I just ended up paying him. 
<laughs> no, it's, uh, that's actually the better way to go. Um, yeah. in, in Monopoly, it was me, my favorite corners were the New York Avenue, Indiana, Illinois Avenue. Because like, even though it's not the most expensive, I then noticed like, in that game, like there, there are some moves in games that just for some reason always happen. Like, like for example, in chess, the Sicilian maneuver, their they're, they're, they're right one, the right of the king, right, to respond to the opener of the queen, you can't do that on the white side of the board. It doesn't work the same way. Right. Oh, so I, yeah, it just doesn't. It just for whatever reason, the stand the standard opening play with the on white is is king side is king side pawn, and the response is the right is the is queen side right. It's called a Sicilian. You can't do that. You can't actually do that. For Monopoly, I find New York Avenue that whole that particular corner is everybody hits that corner. The what the way boardwalk the boardwalk and park place are expensive, but the way that that corner's designed. You have a good chance, actually, of avoiding the mass properties in that corner. Whereas, for some reason, for some reason, when you go to New York, and I can't believe I'm talking game theory with you as the opening thing here. Um, but, uh, but, but for some reason, in Monopoly, I find that New York, Indiana, Illinois, that whole, that whole corner is always hit. I'm not quite sure why that is. Okay, which which corner is that? Because it, it, the free park. I play this with my siblings. We would play Cat in the Hat Opoly all the time. Yeah. So all the names the, are different. The, the free parking, the free parking section of the game. Oh yeah, that, yeah. That corner always gets hit. It does mm-hmm. does it? It doesn't matter. It seems to me. Whereas you go to the other opposite corner, that the most expensive stuff, most of the time gets avoided. Mm-hmm. Right. All right. Consequently, I actually like prefer the cheaper properties in that corner over the more expensive properties in that corner because it adds up better. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You always when you yeah when you're playing a game like that where you're making money off of other people, you want to have it so that you have um, <laughs> the things that are the most consistent. Yes, exactly. Have you ever played Machi Caro? No. It's like Monopoly where you can still be friends with people afterwards. Oh, good. <laughs> So it's like it's a it's a card game more so than a board game, and you get properties. So there's primary, secondary, uh, tertiary industry, um, and you can buy these cards and you can make money from uh, uh, when people roll a die. So primary industry, you get money anytime that somebody anybody rolls the die that rolls the number that's on the card. So like you can have um, different kinds of farms. You can have fishing boats in one of the expansions. You can have, um, there's a ranch. The ranch is super handy early on. Um, so those you can get anytime anybody rolls a die. And then there's the secondary industry, so that's, like, manufacturing, essentially. And you get money from that anytime that you roll the die. And then the service industry is my particular favorite. I don't use it a whole lot, but it's my particular favorite because you get money anytime anybody else rolls a die. So the first game that I ever played, I had this lovely little cafe, and everyone kept rolling threes. So every time they kept rolling threes and activated my little cafe, I would just be like, oh, thank you for your patronage, and they'd all just roll their eyes and give me my money. That, but not- so yeah, that one, it's a, that's another one where you want to, you pick based off of the ones that um, you have a better chance of rolling. Ah. I actually so cut down on risks. I actually thought I have, a, I have a board game that's not a math game, although it's very, very elegant in its own way. Sir, mm-hmm. have you ever played Zero? No. Ooh, okay. It's a tile game. It's a tile game, but it's interesting. It's like you, your character is set on a path, and you just dealt tiles at random. I'm sure mm-hmm. there's a mathematical equation for the tiles. I really don't care because it's not really what you're looking at with that. You're, the objective, the objective is to stay on the board. And it's really simple. Everybody places tiles, and the characters move to the very end. And then, and then each tile connects to another piece of the board. Uh, each tile you put connects and creates a road. Mm-hmm. The thing is, you're trying not to hit other players, and you're trying to stay off the edge. Because the moment you go off the edge, you have to go all the way to the pathway that leads. You're out. It's a really simple game. It takes about 10 to 20 minutes to play. But what it was interesting, the only real math on that one is the number of players. Because it's okay at two people. But it's really interesting when you get to four or six people because that gets really challenging. Yeah, especially like the same space that you got. Yeah, exactly. No, it, it, it's a really it, it that honestly is one of my favorite games. I prefer when I play games. I like I like ones that are simple and elegant, like like because there's something really I I admire simplicity because mm-hmm. simplicity is actually really 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 hard, 
but it's also something that's really intuitive and, and logical once you realize it's there. A good example of that, game-wise, Tetris. It's algorithm. Yeah. That's yeah. all the ultimate math game. But, but the thing about that one is, but the thing about that one is, um, it's so simple. It's just connecting lines, and, and, and it's nothing really, really complicated. It works. Another game I really in, in, enjoy, uh, um, I have one called Empire, but uh, the uh, Ricochet Robots, another really cool RAS game. It's a really cool old one, too. And anybody listening to this will probably be like, what kind of games does he play? Like, but I, that's the thing. For me, um, I look at simple stuff and I really, really dig it. Like, that's why I'm a big fan of Lego. Lego, if you think about it, is the ultimate simple tool. But it, yeah. it, but it's so much, it makes so much sense on a macro and micro level because everything is one thing, but everything is also many things. You can teach mm -hmm. science, biology, the chemistry, physics. You can teach philosophy in Lego. Because leg and is you can that, tell stories. That's what I always did. <laughs> exactly, and, and, but that's but that's part of it, right? You, you it it nurtures the imagination, which is very, very important. But it also nurtures, um, but it teaches people critical thinking skills. Like I'm actually of the firm belief that schools should probably honestly have Lego as a regular toy all the way up until the tenth or until the twelfth grade, because you can you guys honestly. You could teach so much and cow kids memorize so much. You mm -hmm. make now you make learning an experience. Yeah. That's well, and it's really good for like uh, kids yeah. who learn really well kinesthetically, mm -hmm. which is it's usually it, it tends to be pretty hard to uh, kind of come up with ways of teaching that's kinesthetic. Yeah. But if you have Lego, then it's like oh, you always have a way of teaching that's kinesthetic. You just do something with Lego. <laughs> Well, exactly. No, it's it. No, it. it and that's the beautiful thing about it, right? It, it's got a. It's got a natural um, aesthetic to it, and but the thing is, it's also it's really into it. But you can use color. You can use color theory with it, with like with the way yep. the blocks are built too. So it, it's one of those things where I just look at like, but that is such a simple idea when you really sit there and think about it. Somebody, mm -hmm. somebody somewhere, came up with one of the. Like I said, that kind of stuff to me is truly genius. The rest, mm -hmm. everything else. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's great and all, but that, it's it's elastic, it's versatile, it's elegant, it's simple, yet, mm -hmm. and that's what I feel like kind of life is, it, 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 in a nutshell, so that's, you know, that's me. But anyway, I, mm -hmm. I, I think I took over the interview. Well, I kept asking questions, it's fine. Oh, if, if, I, if, if, I, if I thought that, oh, we're talking too much about games, like magic, magic, what, what, what? Yeah. Then I would have like you know asked different questions and we would have moved on to a different topic. But no, it's it's interesting. <laughs> you know, well, my mind works a little bit. It's just like that's that's how I kind of look at like, that's the, again to me that's that's true genius. Genius isn't necessarily coming up with something elaborate. Don't get me wrong. If it is elaborate, that's a cool bonus. Mm -hmm. Looking at things that are already there and just realizing how they connect in a way that a lot of people just don't look at. Or take mm -hmm. for granted. That is real genius. That's a, or right? that's my that's my opinion of itself. So. so you must really like the portal games. I do, except I don't. I'm not. A, I'm not. A, I'm not. A, I, I'm not mature enough. I, I no. <laughs> he, 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 this, this sounds really no. No, because here's the thing. <laughs> he, 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 here's the thing about about me. I I'm one of those people. Like I said, I played Hearthstone till six o'clock in the morning last night because I yeah. Because because I really 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 really. Don't get me wrong, I did a lot of work that day, but from about 11 o'clock to 6 o'clock in the morning, I actually played Hearthstone because I unlocked it. I, I played an expansion just because it was entertaining and engaging, but I get really into games. When I actually decide to really be a gamer, I game. And it's just one of those things where it's just like it's a big giant binge for me. Mm -hmm. So this is why I don't play World of Warcraft. This is why I don't play Portal. This is why I don't play Minecraft. Minecraft is an incredibly ingenious game. <laughs> But you know, it, it it really is. I really think it's great. I I, I it's one of those things. It's like I'm like I am not mature enough for this. I don't know if I'll ever <laughs> be mature enough for this. Yeah, and that's just that's just me being honest with myself. It's like I will literally that will be days and days and days. Mm -hmm. of my life gone, just gone. I'll never get. I'll never see them again because I will be like, this is so cool and this is so awesome and amazing. Oh look, a dragon. And yeah, I tend to um. I think almost with all of my games, I tend to cycle through where I just, I love it, and it's like, I, I can't stop thinking about it, and I just want to play it, like, every single day. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, it's like, okay, no, 
no, I think I've played enough, okay, and then I'll just go for a period of time where I haven't played it for, like, ever, and then eventually I'll come back to it and I'll be like, yeah, I like this game, I still like this game, let's play more of it. I, I, it's sad when you realize you, you've outgrown games, though. Like, like for me, for mm. me, for me, video game wise, I love. I used to love Final Fantasy VI. There's still parts of it I really, really enjoy, but I can't play it anymore. It's just because, it's just because, unfortunately for me, it's too. I've done it too many times. It's one of those games <laughs> where it's not even a fun nostalgia trip anymore. It's like ah, uh, <laughs> uh, it's like. And I, I mean, I still own it, and I still always have like a a fond place in my heart because again, it's it's one of the, it was one of the uh, my first and personal favorites. It's also it's the first mm. game I've ever played where the bad guy actually won. So, oh uh, spoilers. Uh, it's it's okay. I'm not I'm not spoiling very much because because that's 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 not the interesting part of the game. <laughs> uh, it it really isn't. It, it, it the interesting part is what comes after. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, so um. But uh, no, like like I, I'm um, also Final Fantasy VI came out in 1994. There is a certain oh. point. There's a certain point where spoilers just. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, sorry, people. I mean, <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I I I I I respect like 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 when the Force Awakens came out. I didn't say squat because I knew a lot of people would enjoy that movie. But there also just comes a point too. It's like like the original Star Wars came out in 1970s. Seven, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody loves Star Wars, and I, I would, and I would not ruin a five or six year old kid's life by telling him what happens because that's that right. that's a really cool experience. If you're over twenty, I, I'm 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 just gonna look at you like this and go, okay, look, I'm sorry if this is a spoiler, <laughs> but but you, you, you've had twenty years, and and. Somewhere, somehow, some way, especially in this culture, Star Wars will have entered your life. You would have had the opportunity to do something with Star Wars. Yes, and and quite honestly, if you're on the internet, at some point you will get spoilers for Star Wars. It's like, um, what we, oh, the Soylent Green movie. I knew I knew the spoiler, the main spoiler for it, before I ever realized it was a movie. I just thought it was like some kind of random internet joke, and I was like, oh no, wait, that's actually like the major twist of a movie that I've never seen. I still haven't seen it actually. It's okay. So it's all cool. Like I, I, enjoy, I, 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 I haven't seen it either. To be honest with you, it just. But I mean, it's one of those things. Like I'm not gonna cry about that spoiler though, just mm-hmm. because I haven't seen it yet. I mean, the universe does not revolve around me. Sometimes I think it does, but most of the time, when I'm, you know, in my more sane, lucid mode, I just realize, you know what? <laughs> you know what? I, I don't, it's okay. I mean, if I didn't want to have it spoiled, I wouldn't be on Facebook right now. That's just the, and that's just the way it goes. Um, there's, yeah. there, there, there's, there's, a, I believe, a courtesy thing about that. Like when, it, when the first something first comes out, mm-hmm. but I, I will say this: I do avoid trailers like the plague now. I avoid. Oh yeah, I remember you telling me about this. Yeah, I avoid. I avoid them like the plague for this reason. I like. I mean, if I can. I mean, even though I have to avoid. I, even though it's impossible now, almost impossible. I manage to avoid every Force Awakens trailer. Every single one. Wow. Yes. That's impressive. Yes. My hmm. argument was. Inc- I've also managed to avoid all. Of- oh, oh, I didn't hear that. For some reason, your volume just, like, went down. Here, I'm turning up my volume. Okay, I'm at 100% now. Nope. I can, I can, like, kind of hear you. It's, like... Oh, I think it's getting better. Keep talking. <laughs> this tiny robot voice. <laughs> so, uh, we're gonna have this tiny robot voice moment in the in the podcast. This tiny robot has been brought to you by. Yeah. Better uh, you. Is, is yes. it is it better or no? It's better now. Yeah. <laughs> that was so funny. But no, but 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 I avoid I avoid Star Wars like the Star Wars run spoilers just for one really simple reason. I'm going to see the movie. Right. So why am I seeing? I don't know. You only see a trailer, in my view, if, if if you're not sure about the movie. I wasn't sure about Deadpool, because I've seen Deadpool, Wolverine Origins, and that wasn't Deadpool. That was that was 
that was not Deadpool. So I, I mean, just and, and and just because Ryan Reynolds is in it, is in it doesn't mean much. I'm a Green Lantern fan. Enough said. So. <laughs> oh, um, oh, such a good point there. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm not saying it's your fault if you're listening to this, Ryan, because I know I understand. I really do. It just, yeah. I, I, I went in there with a little game, so I saw the first Deadpool trailer. But that's all I needed. All I needed to see was the first one. Because I knew, once I knew what, yeah, I knew what I was going to get from that point on. Okay, if this is what I'm getting, I will buy this. And then, some, and then sometimes I will watch a trailer, and I will actually be more confused than when I walked in. Mm, and in a yeah. good way, I'll be like, what did I just see? Yeah. I, okay, the first time I saw the Green Lantern movie, I actually liked it. And then, like, I watched it more, and I'm like... Every time I watch it again, it's just like, oh, wow, that was really bad. Yes. Oh, dear. That part. Oh, that was a really bad part there. Why did they... No. What? No, stop. Just just stop. Just take the DVD out of the DVD player, and we'll put it away and never touch it again. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I mean, I'm really sad, because I'm, like, the biggest Green Lantern fan ever. Mm-hmm. You should see my, my, my comic collection. I have... I legit have Sinestro's first appearance, like from the Silver Age. Nice. Yeah, I legit have that. I am a big, big fan of Green Lantern. I know I pretty yeah. much have read everything that was been published from ni- before, from about 1976 on, like mm. completely. So I mean, it's like, I like, again, I love the mythology. I love the mythos. I hate mm. that movie because it was just like it was too much. They should have. They should have honestly just had him fight Hector Hammond and have Sinestro show up at the end of the movie. That would have been a lot better. Or something like. Yeah. I. Oh. Well, no, yeah. just, just because they, they threw they threw too much in at once. It, it it would have been better to establish him as the Green Lantern on Earth, kind of tell his origin, have him fight. Like Hector Hammond's a good first villain because of his telepathy. He messes mm-hmm. with Will. It's about overcoming fear and willpower. There's a couple mm-hmm. other ones they could have used, but I mean, you get the basic gist, and then. And then, okay, so that means Sir gives him the ring. Okay, you wonder, are there other Green Lanterns? And he has an extra show up at the end of the first movie. Then in the second movie, yeah. right, right? Then yeah. in the second movie, then you introduce the concept of the Green Lantern Corps. You have him actually train, show that enough for what he's overcome, he, he's still a big puss, right? Compared to <laughs> all the other guys. That's the idea, right? This is a yeah, that's, well, yeah, that would be a, that would be a good way of doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that would have been a, a really logical way of doing it. And then you would have had him come to the core. He would again, he could have established because he's such an elastic character where he's grounded on Earth as well as in outer space. You could show right. his struggles. Um, you can show his struggles trying to you know train at night while trying to actually balance whatever kind of life he has. Does he want yeah. to train? Right. I mean, there's a lot you could do with that and just just yeah. that part alone. And. Then you introduce, like, one of his really big bad menaces, like Chrono, or, like, have Sinestro go evil, have him fight Parallax, somebody big in book two, but that not big. And then the third act should be him bringing Sinestro. That's honestly how they should have done that. Because then you would have had, you would have had, and then if you did more movies, then you introduce Star Sapphire. Then you, like, you expand on that mythology. Because that, the thing about Green Lantern mm-hmm. is it's such a huge mythology. You have enough material there, legitimately, to go six movies and they'd be six very different movies and mm-hmm. yeah, there's no there's no um you can have your space opera you can have your pulpy you can have your pulpy crime fiction thing then you could do you could do you know you could do maybe next one that's something like a time travel or you can do something like you know a cop story you could do like there's so much there yes. but you do a love story because star sapphire i mean is his girlfriend so i mean you can just mm-hmm. i mean that's that's that in itself is an intriguing thing too and then you then you can do this one big giant finale and you and this is all within Green Lantern do wheelhouse and this is it is works. Yeah. All the all these pieces. Instead you shot your wad off in the first one and so much so much information got fed on people, it's like brain yeah. oh for the, ah. Yeah, Man. there's there is like too much of an info dump going on. It was like we want a story. We want a story, can you we're well, like we're okay if you give like a bit of info dump so we can enjoy the story, but right now it's like we have the story so we can enjoy the info dump or something yeah i mean <laughs> i mean I, I mean i mean i mean i mean the heroes i mean literally green lantern would have been the perfect hero's journey and you could and i mean story but that's 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 the sad point so <laughs> but yeah that's so i i i just tend to i just tend to look at 
By the way, my guilty pleasure that way is Matrix Revolutions. It's the third Matrix movie. Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, why is it a guilty pleasure? Because I still enjoy that movie, even though there are parts that I know are bad. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I just know they're bad, but there are some parts I really, I really, I really thoroughly enjoy. Um, I yeah. actually enjoyed the final battle, because that, that was, that, that was a very zen moment, and, and most people missed the point of that fight. Mm-hmm. The point was, if he kept fighting, he ne- there never would have been a winner. And eventually, he would, Smith would have devoured everything to win, right? Mm-hmm. And so Neo had to stop fighting. He had to realize that. He just this was not something that you could use force to deal with. It's, yeah, he had to break the cycle. Yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. Which I I dig that. However, the scene where where Smith makes uh, throws the cookies across the screen at the Oracle, I laugh. I shouldn't be laughing at that scene, but I laugh. It's been a while since I've seen that movie, so I don't remember exactly what happens in that scene. But, but it's I di- need to see it again. It's the, it's the dialogue. Once you hear the dialogue, you'll, yeah. you'll understand. It, he, it doesn't leave him well. The dialogue was just terrible, and it just, it just, I just, it takes you right out of that moment. He's supposed mm-hmm. to be intimidating and menacing, and and yeah. and, 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 and and instead he's like, who 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 approved this? <laughs> It's like, wow, I can write something better in my sleep. And I was so, and it was one of those things where it's like, you know, maybe he's just saying nothing would have been a lot better. But, you know, but... <laughs> okay, so you like you like the Matrix movies. What is your opinion on Jupiter Ascending? I haven't seen it. <gasps> what? I, I, okay, you got to understand something. Okay, this what? Is, here, here's the thing. Yeah. Okay. I have books to read. I'm behind on this, uh-huh. right? I got this other one. Uh, in I've already read it. You know, something something about a hidden in seal skin by some writer. <laughs> you know, whoever yeah, she is. Yeah, Deepen. Yeah, I've heard she's uh, she's uh, she's okay. I heard I heard she's okay. Something like that, yeah. starter or something yeah. I hear right now. We should probably we should probably you know talk. To yeah. That. <laughs> but um, you know, actually, by the time this airs, it'll be done. But that all said, it love her books. She's really good. Don't tell anybody I said that. Anyways, but um, uh, but uh, but no, I mean, I have that. I have books from G. W. Renshaw, Sarah Johnson, um, you know, Adam Dries, um, mm-hmm. Better Marshall, Michael Plested, and, and I want to read those books, <laughs> and and so that means I have to make some choices. Like I, I rarely go to the movies. Just because, just because it's it's time. I just don't have it. The only time I, I, I mean, it's one of the few things I really like doing with my sister, because it's one. Of, it's something because we both don't have a lot of time. So when we're together, going to a movie is is, is a very um, the cool thing to do. Of course, I I I I I, I turned her on to the cult of Deadpool. That's just, <laughs> that's a funny story I to tell us. When we go when we go see the movie Deadpool, she goes to me. I go to her. It might be. See, I'm not sure. My sister doesn't quite share my sense of humor. Some of it is completely justifiable, but the, some. Uh, but I have a little bit more of a violent, savage outtake on life than I let on, and um, it, it so it gives, leaves me a little bit more twisted than some people would would uh, be able to handle. And sometimes she she has the same sense of humor, and sometimes on that kind of stuff she doesn't. So I wasn't sure about going to Deadpool. She so we go into Deadpool. She's like, I'm gonna start. It's gonna be very, very crude, crass. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's gonna be like Shrek. It's like no, 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 <laughs> no. It's it's R rated. No, 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 no. It, 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 the R rate, the R rating has nothing to do with it. It's the fact that Deadpool is so crazy. He knows he's in a movie. That kind of yeah, but, yeah, but, we'll just assume, yeah. That that kind of that that takes a certain insanity, and you have to go in there with that mindset. No, she loved it, and it was great. But it was just like I, I still I still choke with her. It's like Shrek. Yes, yes, it is. <laughs> Well, okay, so, so you have to at some point see Jupiter Ascending because I'm very, very curious what you think of it. Sure, I will. I will. Yes. I will. I will. I, 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 will, I, I will. I will. I will find it. I'm, I'm sure at H and for like five to ten bucks, and I'll go pick it up. The other movie I want to see from last year is actually Creed. I like the Rocky movies. So, wait, which? Creed. It's the uh, the Rocky. Oh. It's the Rocky spinoff. I heard it's actually really good. Oh, I didn't know that that was the thing that happened last year. Yep. Oh. Yeah, it's okay. Okay. It's okay. It's like rock. It's like Rocky six point five. I mean, seriously. After six after well, <laughs> he's in the he's in there, but it's not about him. It's about it's it, it's uh, 
But it's like I said, it, it, it's not really about him. It's just in that universe, and it's kind of... Yeah, oh. it's kind of like a side story. Yes. Yeah, it's, kind of like Rogue One is going to be like a side story, but like its own thing. Yeah, which yeah. I'm fine with. It's Star Wars. I'm going to see it. That's, oh, yeah. Really, really it's, it, that's not <laughs> a question. So, I mean, it's like... It's like yeah. one of the... Like, what I heard, okay, I heard, like, they're like, oh, yeah, so the next, after Force Awakens, the next Star Wars movie is going to be in two years. I'm like, what? And then they're like, in between that, like, the year between that, we're going to release Rogue One, and this is what it's about. And I'm just like, yes, I approve. I, I am willing to wait because Rogue One is a thing, yes. Yes. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's almost a year and a half. They were actually going to do it six months in, but they decided they wanted to own Christmas. I understand. Or, I understand. Yeah. Kind of. I mean, on the one hand, you have to admire their deviousness. Disney's pretty much said... We own December for the next, like, five years. Yeah, they <laughs> yeah. That's pretty much what they said. It's like, we own December. And yeah. there, and, and everybody else is like, unless you're Harry Potter. Yeah. yeah. They own <laughs> December. Even Harry Potter, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, to Star Wars. I, I, I put it to you this way. It would at least be competition. I don't know if it'd be... It, 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 it would be a strong number two... I would not, and, and seriously, at that point, though, I would not want to be any other movie that month. I'd be like, fuck me. It's like, yeah, it's like, yeah. well, even, like, when, do you know when uh, this The Incredibles 2 is I'm, coming out? Yeah. I know it's a thing, but I forget when it's coming out. But, yeah, even that one, like, as much as there are people who are like, yes, this is going to be a thing, yeah. Yeah, don't do it in December, Pixar. Just don't. Oh, well, no, see, Disney okay. owns, I think Disney owns Pixar. So they, they, it's, like, it's like their own little studio. So it's like, we're not going to mess yeah. this up. We're not going to mess this up. You can yeah, no. over. We'll yeah. give November the month off. Someone else can take November, and we'll cross <laughs> December. Right? And that's pretty much how that's going to work. That, 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 that. No, you see, you're smart. Like, when you do, like, a bunch of releases, you, you don't yeah. want to, again, it, it, it's kind of like the Green Lantern. You don't want to shoot your wad off in one shot. What you want to do is... is you you, you, you you entice them. You give them a nice a nice warm up meal. Like the Incredibles, scary. The Incredibles is the warm up meal for Star Wars. That's a scary thought about that. Really? Like, I don't that, that, that's that's scary. Well, think about it. It's like, it's like Disney. It's like Disney has like temple projects. Incredibles leads into Star Wars, or or Star Wars December Incredibles Springtime, right? Right. Temple. Yeah. Like, it's their temples. So it's like that's. That's actually kind of ingenious. That means you own, you're own, you, you're giving your audience about actually oversaturating them. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, so what's your take on all the uh, live action stuff that Disney's doing now? It's, live action remakes. Um, my take on live action remakes. Um, uh, the spirit of them, if the spirit of them is done well, they can be good. Remakes aren't necessarily. I, I'm of two minds of remakes. Remakes mm -hmm. are. If they're done really well, I didn't, like for example, I like the 310 to Yuma remake that like, they did a few years back. I don't know if it was Disney, but like like that was a live action remake of a mm -hmm. movie, and I was like that that was really good. I enjoyed I enjoyed it, um, mm -hmm. but it, it, there there comes a point too where um, you look at the originals always are going to be better, almost always mm -hmm. because because the story beats on the originals. It's like um, the Karate Kid and the Karate Kid. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, I mean, it's a serious example. It's like Karate Kid, the first movie, the reason it, it works for a lot of different reasons. Um, mm -hmm. Pat Morita was amazing in that movie. But it's also the the lessons, right? The lessons and the depths and the thoughts. This was, it was about, about learning to have confidence in yourself and learning how to defend yourself. I mean, it's the ultimate, it's the ultimate, um, self-defense movie the tournament almost isn't necessary other than it's just an, a venue for him to prove himself against the people that right. tormented him yeah it's, and it's, not, it's a goal to work towards or, yeah, yeah it's a vehicle it's, for it's, it's, yeah, yeah right but i mean but some of the other scenes like you know pat marie like like mr miyagi having that the the the, the anniversary of his wife's death that was that was mm. cool the, the bonding moments between daniel and things when you go to the modern one mm. it, don't get me wrong, Jackie Chan's a good choice. If you if you want, if you can't get Pat Morita, he is mm -hmm. not a bad alternative, right? But yeah. it's not the same because I mean, yeah, it's not, the action scenes were better in the new one, but mm -hmm. it was never about the action scenes. Like right. if you look if you look at Miss, Mr. Miyagi was considered a badass the whole time he was in the theme. But if you actually look back, he doesn't do a lot of fancy moves. 
any at any point. It, it was it was the confidence in which uh, Pat Morita played the character that that did it. The the yeah. fighting wasn't even necessary. There there's a there's a language to cinema, and a friend of mine actually says there's a language to it. And if you if you tap into that language, you can tell compelling stories without actually doing a whole heck of a lot. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing. And so when I look at a remake, it's more with less. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. When I look at a remake, um, you, you can take an idea and kind of do a different slant on it. And sometimes they're really good, right? <laughs> sometimes they're really horrible, right? <laughs> I mean, there's no. I mean, but the, but the thing is, because the thing is, you're, you're always going against. You're always going against what was there before. And you can't, it's like, again, I gave you Karate Kid, but I can give a whole bunch of other examples, too. I don't know I want to see a remake of The Godfather. Because it just, it just I don't know if you could actually, I, yeah. I don't know if you could actually top that feeling. I don't know if I want to see a remake of Scarface. I don't know if I want to see a remake of Rocky. I don't know if I want to see a remake of The Network. The Network. Or Labyrinth. Yeah. <laughs> Labyrinth, Labyrinth. But again, same thing. David Bowie was a was was evil, but he didn't do anything in that movie. Really, that goes back. It's like, true, actually. Yeah, he didn't he didn't really do anything. But I mean, but it, it was the character. I mean, he's saying, you know, there was that. There was music. Oh no, no, no. but I mean, in terms yeah. of actual acting in the movie, if you look at it, that he didn't actually have to do a whole heck of a lot to actually give that feeling that he was evil, mm-hmm. right? He, yeah, he, it's kind of like I. It makes me think of um, so Ursula Le Guin. Mm-hmm. As like all these sci-fi novels, and, and I remember reading where she was talking about somebody had asked her, "Oh, like how do you how do you do how do you make up like all these worlds with these cultures and these?" She's like, "I actually don't. I just came up with names of planets, and you assumed that I had made up more than what I than what I said." Yeah. Because well, like when somebody is reading a book or watching a movie, they fill in all of the details. So what you what really makes it work is when you have the right details to really just spur on the imagination of the person who is reading or watching. Absolutely. Like, look, I mean, ultimately what we're doing, like, as storytellers is we're conveying an experience. It doesn't really matter what medium it is. Whether it's mm-hmm. comics, whether it's comics, whether it's, it's prose, whether it's movies, whether it's YouTube channel, whether it doesn't really matter. What you're doing, the idea, the reason why, by the way, I'm a big fan of YouTube is the interaction, the live interaction, like mm-hmm. Twitch does really well. Is there's a there's an interactive component to it, and mm-hmm. or, and that's why it works. Um, you are trying to create an experience for the audience, your audience, whoever it might be, right? And so like like when I do the Watcher, that's a that's that's a different experience than when I'm going to do the Stick Figure Revolution, right? That's a very yeah. that's a very completely different thing I'm going for there, and whereas. I'm doing my autocorrect novel, which I'm working on right now. That's an also a very different experience, right? Right? And then when I do Steampunk Santa, that's also a different experience. And when I do my filthy comic book, I mean, it is a filthy, dark comic That's also. But the idea is, the idea is I'm creating, I am, my job as a storyteller is to provide a story for people to follow, but also interact with. The best, best worlds. I mean, when I read books, the best stuff I remember, like, I love the Wheel of Time because I love that world, right? And I, and, and I love, like, I love the interactions of Perrin, Matt, Rant, you know, you know, Rand. I love that. I love, I loved, um, I love Swan and and, and and oh man, Moraine. I love that. I love Land Unity. That was fantastic. Matt and Swan is still my favorite interaction in that whole series. I just, I, I, I just, I just love the fact that neither, neither of them had a clue about the other. So it's like, like. Nothing like I expect at all. I don't have a clue I'd have to deal with you in one. Like it, <laughs> that was Matt's perspective, and then when you get to Twan's perspective of Matt, it's like mm-hmm. what? And there's just lines like like Matt had said and echoed it in book ten. Like what? he didn't know this woman at all. And then and then on the flip side, um, she's like what? Like when she actually sees him as a general for the first time ever, it's like what sort of man has she put on herself to? After all this time, she realized she didn't have a clue. I'm like. That is perfect. I mean, and, and that is their whole. They play with each other, and that's really, really. And that, and that, I love. Like again, good world, and there's a, there's a really good natural interaction there that really mm-hmm. works. Um, when when a lot of people when they tell their stories, the biggest thing they have to a lot of people tend to forget is your audience. 
right? You have to go out there. You have to. You have to realize something. It's. Uh, I'll tell. I'll tell you. Like my very first signing, I did a signing ten years ago. Mm-hmm. It came to the signing. Exactly. They didn't come in to get a book, but they did come to the signing. And this is what I did. I was in the back. I was. It was really poorly advertised, and that was holding me. I was just like, I admit it here on live in live podcast land. But <laughs> what I did was. But what I did was. Because the store was in a really bad location, just you couldn't see it, and so I'm like, so how do I get people to come to the store? So what mm-hmm. I did is I had I had the guy the guy who was in the store. He printed out giant arrows, and I taped them down. I made a pathway. I made a pathway, and people followed. You got to understand, like this is no, it works. I love that. No, no, it's, <laughs> it's simple, right? You got to understand. This is what people fail to understand. This is what a lot of authors miss when they're doing signings, book tours, things like this. You, your job, one of your, one of the things about going out in the public eye is you're creating an interactive experience, Mm -hmm. right? That's that's the thing. You have to be you, but you got right. But in so doing, make yourself open to be interactive with who Mm -hmm. comes by you, right? And this works, and this does not apply just with sales and and tours. It applies with your stories, too. You Mm -hmm. have to create a window where people can come in and feel invested in what you do, right? Mm -hmm. reason why I I, I mentioned the Percival thing. Percival works. You want to know why? Because he he, he has no clue, and he's he's easy for the reader to interact with because as he's planning things out on the page, so is the reader, right? 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 It's it's a really natural thing. That's That's why the hero's journey is done over and over and over again, whether it's Spider-Man, whether it's Randall Thor, whether it's, um, you know, Aragon, whether it doesn't matter, right? The reason mm-hmm. it still works is because I don't got a clue. I don't want to look at this book. I open the page. Mm-hmm. Oh, he doesn't have a clue either. It's an easy thing. It's, it's, it's mm-hmm. a conscious thing, right? That's why well, it's it like the whole, the whole mystery genre. Yeah. Like the, the audience is actively along with, the main character trying to figure out what happened. Yep. I, I actually look at mysteries as kind of like a game. Like if I were actually designing, yeah. no, I actually if I were to actually design a mystery, I would I would mm-hmm. I would the, the the mystery in of itself is almost to me like again I've never written a mystery so this this might be completely me talking out of my ass. So <laughs> um, but um, but to me the mystery is the least interesting thing. It's the game. Mm-hmm. Right, it, it's the game of it's the journey of putting pieces together, putting different possibilities, planting thoughts and ideas into the, into the reader's head of what might have happened. That to me is actually more intriguing than the mystery itself, right? Because the truth is important, and I, and ultimately that's the, uh, there there ultimately has to be some kind of resolution. But I just I like the idea like this this actually borrows from horror. I like the idea that if this could happen. You put that doubt mm-hmm. in the back of your head. My favorite all-time mystery story I've ever read is The Billard Ball. It's an Isaac Asimov short story, but it was written like in the 80s. Mm-hmm. And you sit, when you finish that story, when you finish that story, um, you actually don't know if there was a murder or not. It oh. actually works both ways. <laughs> no, because, because what happened was a um, guy came up with this... Uh, him and his buddy were playing pool. Mm-hmm. A- and... And there were scientists they would argue back and forth all the time, but they would always play pool together. Mm-hmm. And so the one guy was permanently against his power source. And the mm-hmm. other guy was going to prove him, prove him wrong. Mm-hmm. He does. He does. In fact, but the way he does, well, here's what happens, though. He gives the guy, he uses the pool, pool as a way to show, to show the power of his system. He lets mm-hmm. his friend take the honorary shot. So it works. It goes in and fires. But... It goes through the guy's heart and kills oh. him, right? Not the guy that fired the billet shot, but the guy that actually proved it right and kills him. And his partner inherits everything, right? Now, now, so, so when you read the story, when you read the story, mm-hmm. did he kill him? Or didn't he kill him? Because it could have very easily been an accident. There's enough plausible evidence to go both ways, right? It's like the lady and the tiger. Yeah. I, I hate I, that story. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> Saying, I'm just saying, it's that's my favorite. Okay. The possibility, like, you don't, although you want a conclusion, right? Although you want a conclusion, mm-hmm. something like a mystery, you want the I, the thing about that genre is you want to make the reader's imagination go, and the way you do that, yeah, you present several plausible scenarios, 
that do work, even when the truth comes out, leave a kernel of doubt. Because if you do that, mm. go back. That now again, I could be completely talking out of my ass, but that's uh, I, but that's like if I gotta, gotta try this out, that you, like write a mystery. Yeah, no, I know. It no, works. No, I, I'm actually. I, it's not mm-hmm. one of my many things to do. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's I, like, oh, yeah, I did not need another item on my list of projects. I it, really it, didn't. No, no, no it, honestly, um, <laughs> no, my next, my next challenge personally is, um, I want to, again, I've done poetry. I actually got published again. Um, I'm going to be published again in the fall in an anthology. Actually, Ooh. yeah. I nice. did a little concept thing, um, about a week ago. They liked it. And not just mine, but everybody that was involved in there actually putting a little, a little collaborative thing with everybody did for that weekend. So I came up with a small concept album um, for that. And it's just that's that Saturday, just that whole Saturday with me. And it, it's really cool. Um, mm. But so it's like 12 small little poems, but it'll, it'll be coming out. And so, but the thing is, I've done poetry. I've done, right. I've done, I've done it. So for me now, it's, it's. Prose. Prose. Yeah, totally. And that's, that's the next, and that's the uh, next thing. So. Nice. Yeah. So. Cool. So what what else there, Miss Interviewee? What other evil questions do you have? Evil questions. I was looking at the time, and we've got like we're almost an hour. So I, I know. So uh, so this is your interview. So you 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 get to make this decision. I am simply your guest. So <laughs> so we could wrap this up. Mm-hmm. See, now I want to know if I actually have any just like straight up evil questions. Yeah. Okay, ask me ask me ask me straight up evil questions. You, you this is your interview. Look, worst case, look, look, this is, I, I, I can, I can totally speak from the person's podcast that if we go a little long for the 52nd episode, I am sure he'll find it some way to actually make it happen anyway. I don't know how I know this exactly, I just, it, <laughs> but I would rather, I'd rather, I'd rather it go the way you want it to go. This is your interview, so go, so go nuts. Actually, I think... Honestly, I think this has been a good flow of conversation. It's kind of yeah, been good. Yeah, I kind of I kind of came in here being like, well, I could ask a few of these questions, and and you know if if we kind of need the the push, but apparently we didn't. So no, no we, we we talk or we, we talk even when there's not an interview going. So yeah, so, yeah. I, so this is the part. It's we, it's almost like like we like each other or something. Like almost, we're friends. Almost. Like it's kind of crazy. I know it could be friends. Actually, what we, should, we, we, what we should do, this is what we should do before before we wrap up. Yeah. I, I'll do this part, and then I'll let you wrap it up the way I wrap up every interview. Um, first things first. If you want to meet Taya Ben Deepen before she goes off on her worldwide odyssey, and I will be there, too, with her name on my name tag, right? you should come to the Edmonton Expo, the 10th, what is it, 24th, 25th, 26th? Uh, 23rd, 24th, 25th. There you go. September 23rd, 24th, 25th. I will be there. Taya will be there. I will be this. This is pretty much how I am in real life. You can ask her. So, and I will. I, Except it's like more three dimensional. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Instead of, the, you know, just a voice. And, um, and, I, and we will both be there. Mm-hmm. Will your Kickstarter be, book, will the book be there? Uh, you know, that depends on how well the Kickstarter goes. Okay, fair enough. You will, yeah, we will know when this episode airs how well it goes, but right now, I have no idea. So, all right, so, so Hidden Seal Skin, The Illuminated yes. Heart. Yes. Um, Care of the Brave? No? Yes? Um, I think I still have some pins left. Cool. They don't really sell very well, so... We bring them anyway, what the hell? Yeah, okay. well, they'll be there, yeah. So, so they'll be there. I will be there with The Watcher and Storm Dancer. And we yes. I, 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 and I will and I will talk your ear off. I'm good at that. So <laughs> so that'll be at the Edmonton Expo, September 23rd, 24th, 25th. Be there or be square. All right. So we got that. So this is the part. Now, so how do I wrap every interview up? Have you listened? What did I do about nine interviews? You? Ooh, ooh, I'm putting you under the spot here. I don't remember. And to be honest, I really only rarely listen to podcasts because if I listen to podcasts, I have to be doing something. Yeah. And otherwise, I just get super antsy, and I just I can't I can't do it. Okay. So, so I don't know. Okay, so so what what you you're supposed to do is you're supposed, <laughs> you're supposed to wrap let me wrap up with me promoting my stuff because I don't get the chance to do that very much. So oh yeah yeah okay 
So is, 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 it can't go? Is, is, is it okay, boss? Wait, wait, am I you talking about your stuff right now, or am I talking about I, 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 I'm going to be talking about my stuff since I'm the guest. You're, you're, you're the interviewer. You're, you're... I, yeah, I'm just here to facilitate entertainingness coming from your direction. That's yes. Right. That's, right. That's, that's right. That's right. That's, that's <laughs> I do interviews. That's the way it goes. All right. So, my website is joshuapentelaresco.com, J-O-S-H-U-A-P-A-N-T-A-L-L-E-R-E-S-C-O, Dot com where you can read about my wonderful inspirational stuff, my podcast, my books. My current book is Storm Dancer, which you can check out at Amazon, Al's Mess Books, and if you're in Calgary, um, or you can go over to Chapters of Barnes & Noble. My Twitter and Instagram is at jpentelaresco, right? And uh, you can find me on Facebook, too. Nice. That's how you do it. And... Josh... Shush!